Hello and good evening again. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to give this, uh, take this time to uh, welcome you all of you to our evening meeting now. And uh, as we go through each night, I am really sure the Lord will bless each one of us and reveal to us things we have never known before. You see, tonight's topic is very, very important for us. As a child growing up in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, I've always wanted to fly in aeroplanes, okay? And the idea of actually sitting in a flying object right in the midst of clouds, I thought in my imagination, was the coolest thing that could ever happen to me. But I remember the first time when I, when I get onto a New Guinea flight from Mount Hagen to Port Mosby to do my grade 11, it was not fun at all. I didn't like the suspense hanging up there in the air and looking down this massive distance from Mother Heath to where I was seated, it was so scary. I guess that is the same kind of experience you go through. But you know what, tonight's topic is called a celestial exit. Now, celestial exit is really talking about uh, there is a possibility that humanity will make an exit out of where we are living today at this point in time, my brothers and sisters. You know, for many, many years and for decades and centuries and thousands of years, mankind's fascination, fascination of, of space and exploration has been going on. Especially today in our day and age, man is able to build machineries that can go up to space and they have the International Space, space Station and there is constant uh, flight in and out going in and there. But this sort of transition from Earth to space has not always been that good. I remember when I was in school, we were confronted with the image of the disaster in 1986 when the NASA team that was preparing for this particular flight out in space were completely dismantled and the all rocket exploded in space. On the flight was a young, well, not a young, but a teacher who was planning to teach a class back home from space. And that was going to be one wonderful experience and everybody looked forward to it. But unfortunately, the whole rocket blasted in space and every single one died. And not very long, uh, long ago in 2003, the space shuttle called Columbia was also destroyed, completely disintegrated in the air and simply disappeared in space. So it, it seems to me that, you know, everything that man tries to do, there are unfortunate accidents like that does take place. But human curiosity for space that we have now, I believe is not the result of modern knowledge or advancement of technology that we have. It has lingered in the human mind for a long, long time. Where, wherever you go, to whatever country you go, whatever cultural backgrounds you confront with, they'll always have stories that they tell about some creatures from the heavens, whether they tell it that it's a star or a moon or the sun, or somehow mankind has been trying to find a way out of this place to see who is responsible for the suspension of sun, moon, and stars in the heavens above. You know, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that uh, over the years, many cultures of this world have become so involved in the study of space, and in fact, some of the gods and goddesses have been factored into some of the images and expressions or impressions they got in space. The starry heavens have always baffled the minds of mankind. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or an astronomer. All you need to do is go out of in, the, in, the, in a clear sky and sit under these twinkling stars with, which may number in the billions. And every time you sit there, somehow you will feel this unusual sense of spirituality connected to the space outside. The Greeks and gods that existed in space. Romans also and gods that existed out there in space as well. But as we come on further to our religion, Christianity, 
we also have a special link. It comes from this ancient promise recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 1. This is the two angels telling the disciples as soon as Jesus ascends. And the text says, the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So when Christianity began, Christianity began with this powerful hope, hope that the Jesus that left them and went to heaven will come back exactly the same way he went up. Jesus promised this, in, actually, in chapter 14 of the book of John and verse 1, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. He believe in God and believe also in me. So our plan to go into heaven or the Christian's hope to ever go to heaven is based on the promise that one day Jesus will come back again after preparing a celestial dwelling place for his followers. And so this journey in that Jesus will come to take us home will not only begin well, but it will end well. Unlike any of these catastrophic news or experiences of rockets being blasted out of the sky for whatever engineering malfunction or technological malfunction will not happen to the idea of Jesus' plan to rescue humanity from this world. You see, because Jesus is our commander, he is going to be the captain. He will be the one who will come to take us and lead us home at that point in time. The stars, the moon, and the sun that we only hear about, or descriptions people who know about those items tell us and we become fascinated with it, or a lot of us become too curious about it, all those things will be just part of our journey as we travel through the spaces as Jesus takes us there. He's coming to take us home. You see, how do I know that he's coming to take us home? Because he promised so. How do I know that his promise will fulfill? Because everything Jesus promised, not one of them has failed. Everything gets fulfilled. God's end time plan is revealed in God's word. God's word is not only a book of instructions how to live good moral lives or how to be fair and honest and administer justice and provide very handy social services to the needy. Yes, all those things are recorded there. But did you also know that the Bible has a very specific plan to deliver its people out of this world? At this point in time, there is a massive debate going on regarding the environment and the climate, climatic condition. There is going to be a United Nations, a special meeting that will be held in November of this year, and one of the leading agendas of that meeting will be climatic conditions. Now, why are they saying that? Because this is the only world we have, and we mustn't destroy it in any other way. But I want to tell you this. God has a plan to deliver his children out of this world. One of the books that contains that plan is the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation the central theme of the book of Revelation actually is the study of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who came as a human being and now is in heaven right now, and the book of Revelation tells of how he will come and take us to heaven. So in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14 we read, Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. So the imagery John sees here is the imagery of this massive cloud upon which Jesus, now crowned a king, seated there surrounded by angels. Imagine this. In the book of Acts, Jesus, when he was taken to heaven or when he ascended to heaven, the Bible says a cloud covered him. So likewise, in the same manner, over here in the book of Revelation, we see clouds surrounding the presence of Jesus up there to indicate that the last book of the Bible or the last book of the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation, is actually keeping the focus and the faith of the Christians 
who had the promise that Jesus would return, and the book of Revelation is saying that that promise is not in vain. It will fulfill. So John, in his vision, he sees Jesus seated on the throne. The imagery is he is returning as the king of kings and lord of lords. The text says, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sh- sh- sickle, and ready to come and harvest. The same Jesus that came as a helpless babe into this world and born in Bethlehem is coming with power and great glory to deliver and set his people free, not free from the slavery of, of, uh, of the, and, and the circumstances of this world. No, he's not coming to free them from cities and putting them in some uh, cities or places out in the countryside. No, he is coming to take them out of this world into his own dwelling place. Revelation 19 and verse 11 says, And I saw the heaven open and behold a white house, that is a white horse, that is Jesus Christ coming. And he who sat on him was called the faithful, that is Jesus' title, the true, that is Jesus' title. In, in righteousness, he judges and makes war. So when he comes the second time, he's coming as a warrior to fight against the enemy and the devil and deliver his people. So when he first came, he came as a humble servant. This time when he comes, he comes as a mighty general to declare war and fight against the enemy and rescue his people out of the enslavement of evil in this world. Revelation 19 verse 14 we read, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So there will be millions of angels coming down. A white house, uh, sorry, a white horse is a symbol of purity and victory and triumph. So the Messiah, the Christ, has now become the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He is coming to take us home. Christ comes to vanish the enemy. He comes as kings of kings and lords of lords. Amen. Jesus, our King, our Lord, is returning very soon. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, the Bible says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and, and of his Christ. And he is the reign over them. So that means when he comes, he is coming to claim which is rightfully is. This world is his. Ultimately, evil and the devil will disappear and Jesus Christ will return. The question is, how will he come? How will he come? Well, God is not some mystic guessing about the future. God is not like someone who comes around in some, you know, spiritual form and only whisper words to people and doesn't materialize in a physical form. No, God is majestic. When he comes, he'll confront the human, the human race. Yesterday, in our presentation last night, I was talking about how God physically came out, how God divided every status quo of how spiritual beings relate themselves to physical beings. They send prophets or intermediaries or or witches or other forms to talk through them. But yesterday we heard about how God just bypassed all that and right from Mount Sinai, he spoke directly to the people. Like, exactly like that, when Jesus returns the second time, there is not going to be any prophet announcing his coming or into some funnels of mystic letter that some individuals see and others won't see. No, my brothers and sisters, when he comes, he will come as really as the sunrise, as real as the sunset. As really as, as you are sitting or standing there, that is how real it will be when Jesus manifests in the sky. Jesus does not guess. He doesn't guess. He knows it. So he specifically describes it. So the Bible prophecy doesn't guess. It knows it too. Jesus, Bible, and, and all the documents recorded are very clear. The second coming of Jesus is not a vague. It is not as uh, it is so specific. It is not speculative. It is specific. There is no prophecy described 
in its accurate detail as the prophecy of the second coming of Jesus. There has been prophecies that have been vaguely predicted, but guess what? Every single one of those vague prophecies have fulfilled to the very letter. There will be a time when I'm planning to talk about fulfilled prophecies sometimes later in this program. But for now, one of the things I discover is that all those vague prophecies, everyone has been fulfilled. The more distinct and clear and well-spelled prophecy is the prophecy of the return of Jesus Christ. And can I doubt that prophecy? No, because other vague prophecies are fulfilled. This one has more to, the Bible has more to say than others' prophecies that have been fulfilled. Like, for instance, the knowledge increase and, and the increase of evil and, 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 um, and the world empires that were to appear for a short time and crumble and disappear are prophecies that are fulfilled to the very letter. And so we know Jesus is returning. So the second coming is not an identifying flying object, that it's coming in some secluded part of the heavens or skies, and only some people will witness, and journalists from all over the world will go over there to report this isolated event. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that's not how it's going to come. He, when he comes, is coming, blasting through the heavens. The coming of the Messiah will not rise up as an earthly charismatic leader. That is one way. There are some religious organizations, they feel that Jesus will not, not come from the skies. He will be just one of the many religious leaders or moral leaders or some people who speak to, to uh, sort of uh, convict people of their, of their con conscience. Some people think that, no, Jesus won't come like that. He will come as he said he'd come. God's end time plan is revealed in his word, and this is what it says. Luke 17 and verse 23, the Bible says, Men will teach you. There he is. Ho oh, ye is. Do not go running after them. Jesus predicted that his coming will be counterfeited by many other false prophets who have direct linked with demonic powers of this world to confuse people's, people's ability to continue maintaining the hope for the return of Jesus Christ. And you will hear yeah, profess self-proclaimed messiahs and Christ existing all over the world to confound the whole issue. You must not listen to them, Jesus said. Some will say he's in this city. And Jesus said, for the son of man, for the son of man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. So the coming of Jesus is just like the lightning, so universal, so obvious that every citizen of the land will observe it. Christ's coming will be so literal, so literal, it's a literal event. A real, literal Christ ascended as the disciples were visually looking at it. Just like that, the literal Christ will come back in the same manner, literally appearing for literal human eyes to behold. Then Jesus that walked on this land 2,000 years ago, touching and healing and resurrecting and doing all kinds of things, all those things that Jesus did were uh, literal things happened to literal people in literal time, and that Jesus is coming exactly like that, literally as you can imagine. Jesus Christ coming will be visible. So people will see the coming of Jesus Christ. It's not coming in some secret room. As some people say, there is a secret rapture, they're saying. Secret rapture is when, when secretly only the believers will hear the trumpet blowing. Only the believers will create, uh, have this feeling that the power of God will draw them. There is not a single Bible text that talks about secret rapture. You look through the whole Bible, or well, at least you go through the Bible, or the teachings of Jesus, and the writings of Paul, and you won't find this little expression, secret rapture, written there. It was fabricated by some people, and guess what? So many faithful, God-loving, 
Very, very beautiful Christians. I'm not undermining the Christians. They are very lovely people. They are born again Christians. They love Jesus. They accept Jesus into their lives. For some reason, they believe in this notion they call secret rapture. It is nowhere to be taught. It's not even in the Bible at all. Because this is what the Bible says. This is, this is a very interesting text. Revelation 1 and verse 7, the Bible says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. That is a public appearance. Every eye shall see him. Not just one eye or two eyes or selected group of saints that will behold him. No, Jesus is coming and every eye shall see him, the text says. So Christ's coming will be audible. It will be literal, it will be visible, and it will be audible. That means we will physically hear the lightning and, th and thunderings and sounds. That's why I shared this message last night. When God began to come and confront Israel, he physically came. How to Mount Sinai? They saw the accumulation of the cloud that was filled with flaming fire, lightning thunder, trumpets blowing. The mountain, mountain that the cloud of the presence of God was resting was shaking that the whole earth was trampling in the presence of God. That was a literal manifestation of God. Sinners in the camp they saw, saints in the camp they saw, it was a physical manifestation. Likewise, when Jesus returns the second time, this time not to give the law to them, but this time is coming to receive them, to be with them, so will it be. We will physically see, we will physically hear, and it will be a literal event that will happen in a particular time setting of the universe, ladies and gentlemen. First Thessalonians 4.16, the Bible says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with a trumpet of God. You know what? When the disciples saw Jesus going to heaven, they had the promise that Jesus was going to come. So the old Christian movement began with this powerful hope, hope that the world was going to end. Hope that Jesus is going to come back and take them to heaven. So that hope really dropped them out. The way they ate food, the way they conduct themselves, the way they were teaching, they are all documented in the New Testament. And it is clearly evident that what this was happening right now was only temporary and the permanent structure of life, the permanent experience of life is actually embedded in, in the story of Jesus. And when Jesus comes, the reality will serve us. And so you can see it recorded here in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 when Jesus, uh, Paul writing says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. So Paul writing, Peter's preaching, James preaching, all the disciples preach, the next generation of Christian preach, the next generation of Christian preach the doctrine of the return of Jesus until it has been repeated over the last 2,000 years, and I'm repeating to you today because today, today I want to tell you, it seems more likely that he might come in our time. Colossians, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, again the Bible says, when Jesus appears, the dead in Christ shall arise first. So that means when the trumpet of God is being blown, people who have died believing will rise up and change in the twinkling of an eye and meet the Lord to be with, her, be with him. Today we have beautiful flower uh, we put around all those people who have died, but all those graves will open when Jesus Christ comes. The Bible clearly tells us angels will blow the trumpet and the trumpet blowing will be so powerful, so powerful that it will penetrate deep into the chambers of hell, where men and women and boys and girls whose life have been claimed by death, they have been resting in the earth for hundreds and thousands of years, will for the first time hear the blast of the angels penetrating deep into their mind and heart. And when they see it, hear it, they will come out with the power of the Holy Spirit, propelling them out of, of the, the dark, decaying places, and they will meet the Lord in the air. Thessalonians 4.16 says, Hold the dead in Christ and rise first. Verse 17 says, 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Oh, praise the Lord. Jesus is coming. Our Lord is coming to take us home to be with him. And the point to remember is they will arise, we will arise, and we will all be together, meet each other. What a great reunion day that will be. And verse 17 says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So when the resurrection takes place, Jesus and the dead and those of us who may be living at a time will unite never to part again, ladies and gentlemen. Matthew 24 and 26, Jesus preaching, he said, therefore, if you say, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go looking for him. So he won't his people. If people tell you Jesus is in the city, he is in the streets, he is in a building, do not go. Why? Because Christ's coming will be a glorious event, he says. Matthew 27, 24, 27 says, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. That is how Jesus Christ will come. The real Christ is coming in the skies. Literally as the sunrise, literally as the sunset, as literal as the nose on your face, so Jesus, our Lord, our King, is coming. The real Christ is coming to resurrect the dead. He's coming to resurrect the dead and is coming to take those people who are waiting to heaven. Matthew 24 and verse 30, the Bible says, The Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn before him. Not everyone will be happy, you know. Today, there are so many people who do not like Jesus. They hate the story of Jesus. They, they feel so horrified and disgusted by the story of Jesus. But ladies and gentlemen, hang on. When Jesus appears, the whole world with nations of people, of races and leaders and military commanders and prime ministers and kings and presidents, they will all mourn because he's coming. Oh, brothers and sisters, it is not only believers who will see him when he comes. When Christ comes the second time, every eye shall see him, Revelation 1.7. Every eye shall. Sinners as well as the saints will see him. Matthew 24, verse 30 says, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. They'll see him appearing literally, visibly, audibly, and gloriously. This is Jesus coming. Will you be there? Are you ready? Will you see him when he comes? You will see him. I will see him. But will we see him as our Lord, Savior, and King? And will he see us as his children? Or will he see us as his, one of his enemies? A terrible, terrible day it will be for those who will not accept him as Lord and Savior today. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Christ's coming will be the climatic event of every event that has ever taken place in the world. It will serve as the greatest event. Sporting gatherings, political coronations, whatever event that we have never ever known will be surfaced by this great climatic event of the coming of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, the Bible says, listen, Paul says, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep. In other words, we will not all die and sleep. Some of us will be still alive when Jesus comes. But we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The glorious penetrating sound will resurrect the dead. The glorious penetrating, the light of heaven that does not even resemble the light of our sun will gloriously transform us into angelic and heavenly beings. Our decaying and corrupt body will go, will be gone. And we will have this transition of changing from decaying human beings into these glorified beings to be part of that celestial community of people. What a day that will be. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53 describes it. 
for the trumpet will sound, the dead will raise imperishable, and we will be changed from the perishable, for the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. The decaying, the dying, sick body is gone. The crippled man will be healed. The blind will see. The mute and the dumb will hear for the first time the sound of Jesus Christ and him speaking. And when that day comes around, there will not be one weak individual crying and leaping around. For all those who have been faithfully waiting for the return of the Lord will be completely transformed. What a glorious day that will be. You know, when Jesus comes, his coming will not be welcomed by everyone. There will be people who will be frightened, as I told you. Because when he comes, everything that we know will be thrown into chaos. Massive structures, engineering structures of massive cities and tunnels and roads that the advancement of science has been enabling us to build will be flattened to death. Bible says in book, book of Daniel chapter 2, they will reduce to dust. They will not have any strength and resistance to stand the fiery fire of Jehovah God when he comes to this earth. He comes through and dislodges the elements of heaven and earth, the matter that we so rely on, the space that we so rely on, particles, all these things will be blown away and out through the corridors of the sky, the one who created and placed them in perfect order comes right through to take his children home. Are you one of them? When he comes, how glorious it will be for those faithful ones who are waiting, praying for him to come. But you know what? Revelation 15 and verse 3, the Bible says, Great and marvelous are your work, Lord, God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. He is coming as the King of the saints. We saints may live in this world without any recognition. No honorary title from the Parliament House or no ordinary title, honorary title from the Queen of England. We may never have any kind of recognition like that. We may not have the share title or, or grand chief title, but hang on. When Jesus comes, Saint Jesus is their king. Jesus is coming to receive saint. If you are a saint now, if you have Jesus in your life now, then you are a saint now. Then he is your king, he is your Lord, he is your savior, he is coming for you. What a great reunion that will be. Mothers and fathers who have parted because of death will be reunited. Husbands and wives who have parted because of death will be reunited. Centuries and generations of human beings who have parted and have not been able to connect each, each, each other up and maintain the human tendency of love and care will all come together and reunite when Jesus Christ returns the second time. There will not be any farewells. There will not be any goodbyes. Once united, always be united. Children coming out of the grave into the arms of the mother, or fathers coming out of the graves into the arms of the family, so will be this dramatic movement of rising soul and beings uniting with their loved ones. Behold, Isaiah 25 and verse 9, the Bible says, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. I am praying for the day to come soon. I have lost my uh, uh, relatives and friends in, due to COVID-19. My sister died, one of my brothers died, another cousin died, and many people are dying. And I am looking forward to the day when this day will come and COVID's power to destroy will no longer be powerful. Death's ability to claim life 
and put them underneath the shadows of brick and mud will have no power at all. Jesus comes. Jesus comes triumphantly to conquer death and to take us out of that prison. So Isaiah saying here, Behold, this is our God. The cry of every saint that has ever lived is this. God, I'm waiting for you. Come and take me home. And when it really does appear in the sky, they will say, yes, this is the one. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. And he will save us. But when the moment comes, the population of the world will obviously be split. On one end will be crying and bitterness. On another hand, there will be jubilant and shouts of glory, hallelujah, echoing right through the debris, right into the very presence of God in heaven. The world will be split. One going to heaven and the other going to hell. The people who are going to hell is being described here in Revelation 6, verse 15 to 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men and the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and free and bond will all be crying to the rocks and mountains and saying, fall on us, fall on us from the one that is seated up there. Hide themselves in caves and in the rocks of the mountains and say to the mountains, saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. But guess what? There will not be any mountains. Mountains will melt. What kind of mountains will protect these people? They can't jump in the sea. The sea will disappear. What kind of water will hide them? There will not be a single material object that is so thick that the penetrating presence of God can't penetrate through. This is a futile attempt to run away of the guilt of rebelling against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and live their sort of temporary life as though it doesn't matter and when the overwhelming presence of the glorious light of Jesus Christ confronts them, they have no way to go. Today is the time to reconcile with God, who is your rightful father, and tell him, Lord, I have been a foolish guy all along. Lord, I want you to accept me into your home, please. Count me in, please. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, please. Help me to be found faithful, waiting for the great day, please. That should be our attitude at this point in time. In Revelation 16, 6, verse 15 to 17 again, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who will be able to stand it? No power, no hydrogen bomb, no army, not even the devil with all his one third of his evil angels will stand up the power when God unleashes his power for one last time in front of humanity. Where will you be, my friend? Think about a serious question. When uh, Moses went to Egypt, he told the king of Egypt, let my people go. And the king of Egypt says, no, I won't let the people go. Who is this God, he questioned. Who is this God that I should let these people go? And first time, Moses dropped the shepherd's rod. And the shepherd's rod became a servant. And the witch doctors, they actually literally brought snakes. They, they didn't bring rods. The Bible says it's rods. But they actually brought snakes. But snakes, in the appearance of no lies, appeared like rods, but they did bring sticks. It was an illusionation, a trick that the devil played. The devil, the reason I'm saying this is because the devil cannot create anything. The devil can't create snake. God never gave creative power to the devil, but the devil can manipulate what is already here. So the servant that the witch doctors brought into the palace was literal servants that appeared like sticks. When they drop it, they suddenly become like seven. Moses' servant was a literal real rod that had become a seven. And what happened is Moses' servant killed his other real servants 
because the other servants who are real servants, ordinary servants, they have no power to fight against a powerful servant that came from God's own hand. Like that. After that, king of Egypt gets up and says, I'll still won't let you go. And God poured out one miracle after another miracle and confronted this ancient king. And the ancient king couldn't do a thing about it. With all the witchcrafts and professions of magics and powers they did, they did not do a thing about it. That's exactly what's happening when Jesus Christ returns a second time. All the evil forces and the demonic powers will be paralyzed, crippled, and they have never seen anything like that before. And when they see it, they too will be crippled. So there is no place to run away to. No mountains, no buildings, no rocks, no security. Today is the time to run, not that time. When he comes and you start running, there is no place to hide because the caves are gone, mountains are gone, trees are dead. The sea is dead. Where will you go? To the, the moon is displayed. The sun has gone out of its course. The stars in heaven have been moved out. Where will you go? The right time to run and look for security is right now. And the place to go is run back to Jesus himself. That's the right place. Now is the right place. Do not wait for the rocks to fall on you because there won't be rocks to fall on. When Jesus comes, he's coming to rescue his people and destroy his enemies, and therefore you don't want to be on the enemy side. Behold, now is the accepted time. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the day of salvation. This time we have now. However long you will be living in this world, it's not for us to look for money and build empires in this world. Yes, we have to do it because we need money. But the more important reason why we have this little pocket of opportunity in the eternity of God that he wants to give is this pocket of opportunity is to make that decision to accept the salvation of God. That's what the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do not delay any longer, my brothers and sisters. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choice we make today. You are making the choice whether to eternally disappear or eternally secure your life is being made by today. For the little time we have, 30-year period or 40-year period or 70-year period or 60-year period, however long we have right now is probationary time, time to maximize this time in making that decision that has eternal consequences, not to play around with this time. What happens when Jesus comes to this earth? Well, let me tell you, there will be seismic have evils in this world. Righteous dead will rise again. Righteous living will be transformed or changed. Immortality bestowed. Immortality be bestowed. Wicked living destroyed. Righteous welcomes the return of Jesus Christ. All these things will happen. Simultaneously, or in whatever order God chooses. Today, we need to be waiting for Jesus Christ. We can't believe in secret raptures or other fabricated stories that Jesus, many people think Jesus thought, like Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven know, but my Father knows. That means the day and the moment only God knows. Why is it that God is not keeping or God is not telling us the day and the moment? I have often asked that question and I personally think it is related to the same question that we would ask in relation to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Like for instance, why is it that God planned the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden? He should have removed it. Let Adam and Eve as doesn't have to go through that fierce testing, you know? Just, just let them live. Some people think that, okay? But we have been hearing the very important reason why he allowed it. Why did he allow it? He allowed it because that represented to test 
genuine loyalty and love relationship to God. If you are genuinely in love with God, then you will obey God's voice. A non-threatening suggestion. God is not saying, hey, do this or I'll slap you. Or do this or else I'll give you cancer. Or do this or else I'll kill your firstborn. Or do this, do this, this or else I'll kick you out of job or anything like that. God is not saying anything in a non-threatening, what seems like a passive suggestion represents a whole ream of eternal consequences out there. And so innocently Adam and Eve picked the fruit and look what's happened. Just like that, he decides and says, no, I'm not going to tell you when I'm returning. It is my divine prerogative. I'm going to keep the exact day to myself why? It is a non-threatening way to say, look, if you really love me, make up your mind when it's your time. Not when because I'm pressuring you with some emotional uh, factors or external factors. You make up your mind just now. So, my brothers and sisters and ladies and gentlemen, church is the situa situation right now. When we don't know the day and the hour and when he's coming, it's almost like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil planted right before us. When you have peace, when you have normalcy, when you have mother and father and everyone sitting you together and the sun is rising the normal way, setting the normal way, this is the time to make that intelligent, conscious decision to follow Jesus. If you don't make the decision, well, there is no middle ground. You will also go to the place you are wanting to go. That is, of course, eternal destruction. But if you do decide, well, you will also reap the consequences of that decision, and that is that you will be with Jesus into his new eternal home of rest. Not just for 10 years, not just for 20 years, for the ceaseless ages of eternity. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, make that choice right now. If you want to make that choice, why not you close your eyes with me and I'll pray with you. Let's pray. Our great God in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful story of this celestial exit, that you are coming not with some, some faulty rockets, Lord, that will malfunction and explode in the Arabian desert or some secluded oceans of the sea or in space. You are coming with your own flying chariot. You're coming down like as you did come to pick up Prophet Elijah. You're coming and Lord, we need to be prepared. Today, Lord, we pray that it is our choice and decision to give your life right now so that we can be part of the group that will reach the shores of eternity. Forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you so pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Join me again tomorrow. May God bless you.